Okay, we are switching topics now, and so we're going to be talking about container formats, uh, both uh, on both ends of the workflow. So the first speaker uh, was was to be Yakui Wang, uh, except for he's he's out sick, so he tapped uh, another uh, big uh, expert in the field, which is Thomas Stockhammer, who is the uh, director of technical standards uh, at Qualcomm. And uh, he's going to be talking, and do I need to slow down again? No, OK, about an overview of the ISO BMFF uh, format. Yes, thanks, Yasa. Thanks, Ali. Yeah, you put me on a hot spot here, because uh, I need to give you an explanation. First of all, ISO-based media file form is probably the least sexy title you can imagine, but it's not my fault. Uh, and it's not just a collection of boxes. But the next thing is I just need to type here, right? So there's no remote. So I want to set the expectations because I'm here and I sent an email yesterday because Ali told me, well, Iku is kind of sick, can you give a presentation? So I put it up to a couple of people up there and said, guys, do you know anything about the file format? Do you have slides? And actually I got some answers from these people which are all there. They're all experts in the area. I have a few slides, but that's like from three years ago and damn, when is the workshop? Uh, I have stuff, but that's like outdated. And I got an, uh, an email from Kirai, which for itself would be three presentations. So that's the guy, Ikui, he's sick. So typically we like each other, but I don't like him now. So let's go into uh, this. So the expectation is there were no slides yesterday. I'm not aware that there's any presentation to file from it, though this is an experiment. So what I looked into, uh, what is the basics in the history, some structures and principle, um, what is, uh, comes along with the specs, so there's tools and what's happening in terms of software. Uh, I think the most interesting part for people nowadays is how you use the ISO media file format in context of streaming and real-time delivery. Uh, it also, there's a couple of other application formats I touched those uh, quickly and also looking a bit forward, what's happening in AMPEG, what is discussed. Very basic dry slides because I didn't know how far I get, so I have some dry slides in the beginning. I'm sorry about this. Uh, so I, I looked up, in, and that's from Wikipedia, so that was my first source. Uh, <laughs> uh, but it's good, actually. It's very accurate. So the ISO BMFF, uh, it actually contains structural media data information principle for time presentation of media data, such as audio and video. And you can also add along with the real-time, untimed data, and metadata. And it's basically a base specification not being meant for a specific application. It can be used for many different purposes. It has been used and extended and augmented for all these different purposes. So for capturing, exchanging, downloading, progressive downloading, local playback and storage, uh, editing, composition, layups, and recently also for streaming, um, and so on and so on. So you find some context here. It's actually defined by ISO. MPEG is the group doing this. It's part 12 of the MPEG-4 suite. And it's actually a joint publication, which is part 12 with JPEG for most of the time. So you can find out more details on the uh, MPEG website. There's a bit of a history here. So that starts back in 2001 when um, there was a, I think there was a call for proposals. Uh, luckily, I was not around back then, but maybe some were. And I believe there were two major contributors there. Um, and the QuickTime form, which was basically provided by Apple, founded the, the baseline for the MP4 file format. And then there was a bit of reworking on this. And finally, what was done that what was initially the MP4 file format then was split into two parts. It's basically now that you have a part 14, which bases on part 12. And part 12 is the ISO base media file format. And MP4 is basically the first instantiation of this. So there is a bit uh, um, more on this now. So since then, basically, there were six editions. So the last one is not yet published, but it's going to be out uh, shortly. There's some issues with uh, the ISO editing. Um, I don't want to go into this. That's a story for itself. Um, so uh, and basically, over the years, a few editions have been built. Um, so until 2008, you see there's a bit of gap. But then from 2012, a lot of activity started with, for example, integration of, of Dash um, and also with uh, other issues which are around of new editions. So the baseline spec is continuously developed to address different use cases, but it's also basically that a lot of um, other uh, specs around the ISO file format are developed. So typically the editions are always supported by amendments and corrigenda, and after some time they roll in editions, which gives you a full complete standard again. 
So here is the, well, the whole suit is probably not correct, but you have the ACE based media file format, which um, basically origins from the Apple QuickTime file format. And then you have basically two um, um, instantiations. One is how you store video, NL unit video, AVC and HEVC and all the derivatives there in motion JPEG XR. Uh, recently, what was also done is, for example, that for time text and visual overlays, there was uh, an extension um, in part 30. Um, also, the common encryption is uh, basically uh, integrated into the ISO-based media file format files. And then you have also external, for example, 3GP and 3GP2 defined based on the ISO-based media file format, their own file format. We have the MP4, there is a motion JPEG 2000, and MPEG 21 file format uh, for all the annotation metadata. And then further below, you see some uh, recent application formats. So CMF based on um, the ISO file format and some of these derivatives. Stash built on the ISO file format. MMT built on this, and OMAF uh, as well. So I have a couple of more on this later. And there are more uh, parts which basically all based on the ISO-based media file format. So the first aspect, I want to look into the structures and principles. And I did this because that's where our file format editor, Dave Singer, is very keen that people understand the structure and the principles. Um, so I hope I, there's a couple of ideas coming through. So what you basically have, you have um, files which are, have three types of structures. You have a logical structures. And a logical structure in the sense that you, a file stores a movie, and the movie contains of uh, several time parallel tracks. So the idea is you have a movie and parallel tracks. The time structure basically means that you have tracks, they contain sequences, and each of the sequences um, has samples in time, and they are mapped into an overall timeline. So that gives you basically the ability to synchronize. And then you have a physical structure, that's basically how you store it. That's built on a series of boxes, also called atoms, and boxes have a very basic structure. They have a size and a type, and based on the size and type, you, they're basically they're instantiated these structures are not required to be coupled, so you can use each of those individually. They're just all documented in the ISO file format. So going a bit through the logical structure. So if you have a media stream, and that's an elementary uh, video or an audio stream, um, then you basically create what is called a sample entry. And sample entry basically defines all the constraints which are necessary to integrate this elementary stream into the file format. Um, so what you have in the sample entry is uh, you associate a media type, um, so the type of decoder needed to decode the stream, a video and audio, and any parameterization that would decoder would need. So for example, the profile, the level. Um, the name also takes a form of a four character code. So people refer to sample entry, for example, to an ABC1. So that's a sample entry that is well defined. There are defined sample entries not only for MPEG4 media, so it has been extended to many other media. Um, MPEG media, but also the file format is used by non-MPEG defined media. And uh, to keep a bit of track of this, so um, there's an MP4 registration authority, I have also one slide on this later, which basically documents all of this. Um, there's also that this tracks and there is uh, subtracks, so there's a lot of uh, details now in the structures. They might be identified, for example, as alternatives to these, I just pick um, this or the other video, but combine it with an audio. And you can declare um, other type of things which allow you, when you have a full file, how you do the track selection. So there is metadata coming along with this. Okay, so um, this basically puts these uh, three principles files, which is the large part, the track, the individual one, and the samples, and provides a bit more details. And then there is the items. The items are basically data which is consumed as a whole and valid for the entire duration. That might, for example, be images coming along, uh, they might have properties, types, positions. So something which is static for itself and, and lasts for the entire duration. And then you have basically the remaining aspects. So a file might actually have uh, data which is stored in tracks or it might be in items. Uh, you might also have combinations. The, the key issue is that the file defines the common timing format. It's also illustrated a bit below, simple diagrams, but I think that provides. The tracks always com com are a specific media type, a codec. It's a single decoder, there is uh, then uh, exceptions, there's always exceptions to rules. Um, for scalable codecs where you kind of multiple tracks, not only scalable, you have multi-view, there's more and more where a single decoder is uh, associated with multiple tracks. So that's one of the things I come back later. Um, it, they may be linked, they may be grouped, and they might also be alternative. They may have association to untimed data, uh, may be encrypted, and they're decomposed in samples. So, the samples, what do they represent? So they represent a contiguous data 
used by a decoder and they have timing associated. So you have a decoding time and a composition time. Uh, these are timestamps. A bit more on this later as well. There's a bit of a trickiness how you express this. They have properties like a size, a position. That's all what you can signal in the format. Um, they may be described in terms of subsamples. Um, there might be association, what you can call sample groups. And you have also sample auxiliary data which you can send along if you need this in the context of your application. Um, there's a physical organization in this that, as like I said, everything is basically in this basic structure which is a box. There's no data outside box, so everything needs to be in a box. Each box has a length and a type. And basically by this indexing of boxes, types, the whole ability that you can quickly uh, index and search the file, so you can quickly process this. That's one of the key issues that you always have basically sizes. So if you want to skip a box, you go immediately to the next uh, box and find this. And there's hierarchy as well. Um, the format itself is very extensible. So for example, if you hit boxes you don't know, there's a rule to skip it. Um, there's a, the header information is hierarchical. Um, and you have two kind of main headers. One is the movie box, which expresses a, a, a continuous real time and a meta box, which basically is a static item. The media data itself is stored separate from the metadata and it's completely unstructured in what is called the M dot or the I dot, depending on what you're using. And it's in the same file as the header or may be stored in a separate file. So that's, for example, relevant if you do streaming. Okay, so this is the structure what you typically have. So, and it highlights a bit of the important boxes and there's some explanation. I don't want to go into all of those. Each of these files has at the beginning what is called a file type box. The file type box gives you basically just an indication of a brand which tells you what is this, uh, what do you find in this movie. So a brand might be associated, for example, to a specific application. It might be associated to a specific track um, in, in the environment of, of CMF for Dash. Then you have the, the movie header, which basically contains uh, all the metadata information. You see that is broken down into different boxes here. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> and so that's the unique container for the metadata of the presentation. And then you have also a track, which basically then uh, has itself track headers. Um, and that, that contains then the media, it describes the media. You have handlers along with this, which indicates the type of this. And an important one is the sample table. That refers to basically the, to all the samples and gives the mapping of time and byte ranges that you quickly can access um, the sample. So you can quickly do a, a fast forward, random access, uh, all type of file operations you want to do quickly. So that's the basic structure. For the rest, um, I don't think it's worthwhile to go into all these details here. Um, I think that's where you would want to read the specification. So in the simplest form, what you have, you have an audio and a video track. You have one movie atom. That movie atom basically then uh, refers and has two, um, two track headers for an audio and a video track. And then you have a separate box, which is the M dot. And the, all the metadata refers to the samples in the M dot. How you organize the samples there is really a matter of your choice. So one way is that you interleave samples. So you always have an audio and a video interleaved. You could also put this completely sequentially. So basically you could do different things. But if you want to do progressive download, then you obviously want to do an interleaving because you want to start playing from the beginning. If you have other requirements, you can store it differently. So the M that is really this unordered container and all the uh, pointers and indices come from the movie header. Okay, from the timing organization, um, I think I mentioned a few of this, so you, each track is a sequence of samples, uh, and samples have assigned a decoding time, so the ISO file format is basically built on decode times, and then you also have a dis composition display time offset. Um, so I, I have a bit more on the next slide by an example, but, um, and then in addition to this, to the composition offset, you might have further ability to shift the timeline of a track through an edit list, um, that allows basically to move data uh, quite quickly into a different timeline. Um, so you have also samples within a track that have different characteristics and you want to specifically identify. So one, for example, is a random access, an iframe in a video. So you want to explicitly signal this, that's a sync sample. Um, and these points are identified by a special table in each track. 
Uh, and you also can have then dependencies. For example, if it's scalable, you want to say that sample depends on another sample. So you can express all of this in this metadata. Uh, and then you can also have the ability of grouping samples to so identify that you have sample groups. Um, and you might assign it to a single group of a given type, and there may be many groups. So you can also define uh, associations, for example, to specific, well-defined four character codes. So one of the mysteries I think we're always struggling uh, is about the timing model. And the timing model is not necessarily trivial because the, the timing model is built um, not on maybe what you used from the MPEG transport stream that there's a presentation timestamp. Everything is built on decode times. Um, and so you have these three timelines. You have decode times, then there's something which is called composition times, and a movie presentation timeline. And what you provide is basically you provide decode times. They can be absolute but they typically are only delta. So you're just saying that sample has this duration, you're increasing this, so you create deltas. What we have done for streaming and better random access, that we have uh, added directly decode times, um, that you have absolute times in intermediate um, samples. And then you have composition offsets. They basically just correct the composition uh, by a small delta. Uh, and that is uh, tried to explain here. Composition offsets are especially necessary, for example, if video being stored where the decode order and the presentation order are differently. So you need to express by composition offsets that you basically say um, you need to present this sample despite it's decoded later, earlier than the other one. So that's where the composition offset comes into play. Uh, if you have the, um, and there's two versions, there's a version zero of track run boxes, what it's called, where you cannot allow it to have negative composition of, so then you only need to operate with uh, positive, and then you have times which are not origin at zero, then you use an edit list to move it back to zero. Um, in, a, in a later version, what was added is negative composition offset. That basically vanishes the necessity of using um, edit lists, but um, this is basically was done later, so we have both versions out in the industry, and it's always uh, a bit tricky to basically make sure there's a consistent usage of all of this, especially if you use it in a streaming environment where you do late binding. So that's, uh, that's something where I think um, people should be very careful to make sure that they use the timing model properly. The presentation time is absolutely essential to have synchronous presentation of the media tracks. Okay. So then there is metadata, there's two forms of metadata. Metadata that may be stored in an appropriate track and it's synchronized with the media. So you can have timed metadata tracks. There's a full specification, I think it's part 10 of the MPEG B suite which defines timed metadata. So you can send tracks which only have timed metadata. They relate to the presentation. For example, you might define a region of interest in a video and say that's the region of interest. So um, you might look there. There could be location information where this is recorded. And there's many different uh, metadata uh, tracks defined. And then there is also support for non-time collection of metadata items which are attached to the movie. Um, and they are stored what is called the metadata box and they're um, elsewhere in the same file or they could also be in another file. So you could also externally reference out of this. Um, and, and these uh, metadata, they have, um, you can do a lot of different things. They might be protected um, and, and they, they there is a variance where, for example, you use this for hint tracks uh, where you can do pre-calculation of FECs or many different applications if you look it up. Um, okay, so I think the rest should be clear. So uh, one of the uh, issues which was in the ISO file format for a long time um, is the ability to fragment movies. So we have discussed that you basically have the uh, movie metadata, the movie box, which contained all the information about the samples. But for application, that was not for streaming initially. It was for the application of recording. A problem is if you basically write here and record something, then you need to write all the samples here at the beginning of the file. And then you basically add the samples. If anything breaks, you basically lose the entire information. So what was done by this is the ability that you can basically create fragments. So you basically distribute the, um, the information which is associated to the samples into smaller pieces which are called fragments. And each of the fragments itself have a movie fragment header and a track fragment header. And then they have another M dot. But these are basically self-contained. 
So that basically allows you that you can store this and have a self-contained piece, and then you have another piece uh, which moves forward. So initially there was a movie fragment random access, MFRA, which then described um, how you can index all of this. Um, in a streaming environment, that's not good either because it's not at the end of the box uh, of the file. So there were then uh, instances that you have other indices. But that's um, the fragmented movies, and that basically is the foundation for streaming. Um, why the file format box is interesting, it has a lot of ability for extensions. So you can add, for example, a, a new codec. Um, you can add new sample groups, which basically you do some uh, annotations. So for example, for HUVC, this was done to signal specific um, NL units. You can have new sample auxiliary data for codec specific data, so like an, an init vector uh, for the encryption. So all of these extensions are relatively trivial. So there's all the means available and you can do it on your own application level. There are harder extensions um, and then there are always the issue of backward compatibility comes in. Um, and so there's these recommendations which are, so you should only use this if other options have been exhausted, simple extensions. Um, and then there's the ability that boxes can be versioned. I mean, a version makes it basically incompatible to an older reader, but that allows you at least to be backward compatible. And then people, when they work on the file format, the first thing they always, they define new boxes. So there's really, the, no, there's a, a strong recommendation to avoid defining new boxes because you should use basically the structural formats. And then there is some rules also how you basically should operate if you define new boxes. So um, be very careful, check MPEG array, make sure that you well define so that it's basically well integrated into the file format. Okay, so then um, there is um, now media. For media putting into the ISO file format, uh, one of the larger specifications is MPEG video in the ISO BMF. So it's a part 15, which talks about the carriage of uh, network abstraction layer unit structured video in the ISO BMF. So this is already bad. This as a whole is like the worst title you can imagine. Uh, I don't even think you can read it as a whole. Um, so basically, because it's integrating ABC and HVC, and potentially it will also be for future video codecs, it, um, it has been channelized. Um, so what you do there, it defines not only what a sample is, so that's one of the definitions, but it also has options. For example, you have parameter sets in the sample entry, and you could say the parameter sets are all in the movie header, or they come in band. So we differentiate, for example, ABC1 and HVC1, and ABC3 and HV1. So the latter one is something used for streaming as well. It more mimics the MPEG2 transport stream. Um, you also define sample groups to describe samples, such as random access. Um, and then there's extensions, for example, uh, how to carry, for example, scalable multi-view extensions to ABC. Uh, you have um, single track, you have multi-track options. So there's quite many options to integrate multi-view scalable aspects into the ISO file format. Um, what you basically, there's a general parameter, which is a decoder configuration record, which basically allows you to uh, move uh, information from the elementary stream on a central uh, box um, on the level um, of, the, of the header. And that's where you basically can describe, for example, what is the profile and level which is included there. And you can also uh, put up, for example, sequence parameter sets. You can put up, for example, a dedicated set of SCI messages which you find in there. So there's the ability to put up relevant information from the uh, elementary stream level onto this higher level metadata box. Uh, <coughs> other media. So for, uh, for audio, for the MPEG-4 audio suite, so there's MP4A defined as a sample entry, um, and that is in MP4 systems. I think that's correct. If somebody says that's not, I accept it. But I think that's correct. There are also, also other audio technologies in MPEG, um, and also I would say what typically is done today that they, in the core specifications, they already define how you do the encapsulation of the audio into the ISO file format. It's such an essential component for system level that typically the audio specification itself do this. There is um, a specification for subtitles which defines how you integrate IMSC1 and WebVTT. Uh, that's part 30. Um, so as I said, you can add external media to the ISO BMFF 
And then there's also a relevant um, external specification, which is the RFC 6381, which is the codex and profile parameter for the bucket media type. It's also not a very intuitive title, I find. But anyways, it permits signal sample entry plus uh, additional information on the level of uh, protocol exchange. For example, you can use this in the content type for HTTP header. You can put it into manifest. Um, so we're discussing this currently because there's the issue of how much do you need on this level and how much you don't need. For example, do we need what type of color space is included? Is it essential for a capability change? We don't have this right now. Do you need what type of encry encryption is used? Um, and so on and so on. So there's a bit of a discussion on how much do we have to expose on the level um, of this parameter and how much you really need to find out by downloading the file and then figuring it out. Oh, five minutes. Okay, so then common encryption. So that's another component which plugs in there. Um, not going into the details, um, you find um, in, by now three editions which uh, adds different encryption modes. There's a couple of specific boxes and structures added to support common encryption. Um, I think people are well aware of the, the basic functionality. It's fully instantiated in the ISO file format. Next thing is, um, so it's more than a paper spec. What you find is there's a whole suite of conformance bitstreams. You find them here. There's a whole suite of reference software, which typically is tried to be updated. And then there's the MP4 array, where you're supposed to register anything which you define in the context of the file format. So that's well maintained, and if you go there, you find boxes, brands, uh, codecs, object types, track references, so there's all type of registrations there you can do. Um, there's also open source, there's lots of tools available, so that's where I ran out of time. Um, you check there where you, who uses the ISO file from it, so from like iTunes to uh, all the streaming and so on and so on. So I'm happy if people provide me more information on this. Okay, streaming. Uh, so we all know about the basic streaming idea that you want to use um, an object-based distribution to work with caching and DRM. So that diagram, I think, has been shown many times. Um, that's what I stole from Kilroy. So why is the file from it good for streaming? Because it's object-oriented. It basically allows you to separate the transport from all the internal details. So we have now objects which uh, are self-contained, uh, typically movie fragments. You have a very extensible metadata model, so you can add new codecs, new subtitles, and so on and so on. The timing model is extensible. You can signal interoperability to the brands, and you can also basically create a larger application model with it. So you're basically using the ISO-based media file format with all the advantages to building a new application format. Uh, a few examples here. So that's basically how you use now the file format uh, for the ISO-BMF streaming. So you use the movie box and the F-type, put it into an initialization segment, that's a separate object. And then you can build a media segment out of movie fragments. And you can put one movie fragment in a media segment or multiple ones. And that, for example, forms then a representation. Uh, another addition which was done in the context of the ISO file format is what is called a segment index. So that's an index up front, which gives you a full description of the movie fragments in terms of the byte ranges and the presentation duration. That is uh, used, you download this and then you can basically use this for seamless switching across representation. It also gives you a full compact bitrate of a time profile for your bandwidth estimation. So that is a binary box as part of the file format, but it's basically consumed by the streaming client. Another relevant issue which is done in streaming is the issue of late binding. So where is the idea in the file from is that the movie is self-contains and has its presentation time. We've always figured out if you do streaming and you have different, um, different languages, different subtitles, different profile, you have a combinatorial, combinatorial explosion of if you want to multiplex those. So you offer each of these tracks as individually and then the client does the synchronization. They still need to be working on a common timeline. So internally, they treat it as they would be in a single movie file, but they basically all stored in separate movie tracks. Another part is basically, I stole a slide from Irvach, so I'm stealing slides, that's what I said, um, is the issue of events. So there's the ability that you can send a very, um, uh, events which are very sparse media and um, synchronized to the media. So the basic idea today is that you add this, for example, to segments, and then you need um, that the dash client 
typically does a parsing of the segments and extracts these events and dispatches this to the application. So that's something which is taken out of the file format because there is not a full support yet, but it basically allows you to send their uh, isolated single box events and you basically can extract this and send it along. Uh, where is the next one? Uh, low latency streaming. Um, as I have a talk tomorrow, I just do the advertising more on this tomorrow, but it shows how you can use chunks and movie fragments in an environment that you can stream low latency. So that's a massive combination of different file format features. It's relatively complex, but it's actually using all good things of the file format to get to a low latency streaming. And actually it's compatible, so you would have an offering where a regular Dash client maybe has a 10 second latency and a low latency makes use of the features can go to a, maybe a three second end to end latency. Um, one of the key issues here, um, why the file format got so popular because it got integrated into MSC in the byte stream format. And so you have the media source extension, a very specific byte stream format. You can write a very simple script based on JavaScript, which allows you to play back an ISO fragmented ISO based media file on a browser using the MSC extension. Okay, um, I, I think I'm almost at the end. There are a couple of other applications just highlighting. There is the high efficiency image file form which is developed, which basically is using also of the file format structure. So it allows to store images and sequences of images. Uh, what was recently done is the uh, omnidirectional media application format so it was developed by Ampeg to support 360 experiences. It's completely based on the file format, but it adds additional metadata structures. So this is the list what you have in the ISO BMFF. There is a recent effort also on the partial file format. That allows that you can store partially received files. We recognize that more and more that is used in broadcast in lost environments. If you only have parts of the file, you want to store this. So this gives you a full suite to store partial files. Um, quickly looking forward, we have one activity which is on web resource tracks. So that basically looks into how we can store HTML dynamic data in the file format, basically to be consumed by the browser, but to basically synchronize it with the media. So the, here, the essential issue is that you want to synchronize DOM updates and events to the media timeline. So there is a, a work ongoing that's on the development. And we plan to have a workshop in this because that's a complex issue which not only touches MPEG, it touches other organizations as well. Okay, and then there is, and I make this very short before I come to the summary. So one of the major work in MPEG right now is how do we get immersive media into ISO BMFF? And if you talk about immersive media, there is many different applications. You talk about Tile 360 video, large point clouds, light fields, so massive amount of data uh, complex scene graphs, audio with like many different. So what you store in the cloud for the tiling, just an example, you have now four tiles. Um, all of those have different representations. So the indexing gets much more complex and also the interface into the decoder because you not only load one uh, tile into the decoder, you need to now load multiple units. So you need to basically correctly synchronize all of this. So that's getting more and more complex. And we, we started to look into this more. That's the immersive cloud media environment where you basically check how can we basically optimize the indexing, the organization of the data in this context. And there's challenges here. Um, you can read them on the slide. We have now new uh, organization data. We have spatial data because um, you now have spatial access depending on your posts. You have quality, or, um, you have decoding capability. So there's a whole lot of things you need to index in order to properly access this um, on the cloud. Summary, last slide. Um, so the, the file format is very successful. It's very versatile from editing, HTTP streaming, all the way to broadcasting ATSC. Very extensible and very dynamic. So the last meeting had more contributions than ever on the file format level. But that also creates challenges. So we're carrying legacy along with this which is no longer in use, so what are we gonna do with this? There's addressing all the use cases and, and still maintaining a sort of a baseline compatibility. And then we also identify more and more that people have very specific applications like this, this immersive streaming where there's a sub-optimality in terms of overhead and processing. So the question is, how much do we basically want to change it? Um, the file form is really the, the stable clue between modern media transport um, 
uh, but will evolve further and new use cases and applications will develop. I think that's it. Thank you. Thanks to all these people who contributed to this. Uh, thank okay. you for it again. Thank uh, you. Round of applause. Uh, and thank you, Thomas, uh, for subbing in for Yakui. Again, Thomas is going to be speaking tomorrow on uh, low latency. Uh, we're kind of running behind again, but we'll, we'll take one, one question on this. <coughs> Anybody? There are a number of experts over here. And I can't see anything. Okay. These are the kind of things that um, uh, published open source reference code would really be helpful for. For the ISO file format? Uh, for MP4 based. ISO-based media. And there's uh, lots of open source software available. I mean, there's FFmpeg. There are implementations, but there's not the official reference code, right? Uh, the, uh, the official reference code is maintained by MPEG. I don't know what the open source license is against this, but there's something from Apple, which uh, I think has an open source license, and you, it's basically uh, available as well. So I think there's a lot of tooling. I'm happy to collect this further. I just didn't have time to get all the pointers to this. Yeah, it's just not, there's just not a publicly available repository. Okay, I, I need to check this. I'm not sure about this. Could be. Okay. Uh, again, thank you. Uh, we'll we'll get going with another speaker.